Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to my show. My name is Jason DeCosta, and this is Consistent Preterism. Thank you for joining me today. I hope everybody's doing well out there. I wanted to talk today about the rapture of the saints, right? And I know there's a lot of controversy and disagreement on this topic. We have um, the futurist camp, which probably makes up for the majority of Christians, I would say, in the world. Um, I would probably for sure say that. Um, so the majority of Christians in the world read the Bible and they see this end event, right? This coming of Christ for his saints, where the saints will be raptured up in immortal bodies, taken away to heaven where they would forever be with the Lord. And then on the other side of that, you have these <clears throat> preterists, if you will. And obviously there's a million groups and, and different sects and denominations in between, but we're just talking futurism, preterism for now. Um, you have this group of preterists, right? Full preterists. Well, there's partial too. Partial is kind of a, it's very lame, right? I mean, if you stay in partial preterism for more than a few weeks, you're, you're probably dishonest, honestly. Uh, but full preterism <clears throat> is ultimately where you would end up um, if you're studying the time statements, audience relevance, if you place a high emphasis on, you know, common sense and logic. But the full preterist does not believe in a literal rapture, right? They believe that well, there's numerous beliefs, right? Some of them believe that it was a spiritual change inside of the body, if you will, some kind of, you know, change that took place in the spirit realm uh, when Christ came for his saints and the living ones who were alive and remained until the coming, um, they would have experienced some kind of like, you know, little internal light switch change where uh, they became immortal and they would not go to Hades when they died and wait for the resurrection, but instead they would now go direct to heaven, right? So they've made up this incredibly uh, convenient understanding or uh, opinion, if you will, um, based on their opinions of when Christ came and when the resurrection was and all that, according to the story. So um, you have the two sides of the coin. Now, in my opinion, without any doubt, <clears throat> and I'm more sure of this than anything that I teach, the New Testament last days definitely 100% teaches a, an actual rapture of the saints at the end. Okay, there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that that's what the story is trying to convey. That's the message that Paul and Jesus are giving their disciples and their apostles that there would be a final upward call, a final gathering of the saints, a taking away uh, at the end of the story. 100%, no ifs, ands, buts about it. So the futurist, the majority uh, position, actually has this part right. Um, they see the rapture, they see the clear statements of Paul, they understand that you know Paul specifically is writing a letter or letters to actual people explaining to them about events that they can expect to participate in. Um, so the futurist 100% gets this correct. Um, now within the full preterist uh, camp, if you will, there's a position called Israel only, which is my position. Um, and uh, one that I'm largely responsible for uh, the, the growth of over the last six or seven years. And in that position, there are those who believe in a rapture of the saints, which I would say is the predominant view. And then there are some who believe that that's not what Paul had in mind. Um, and I don't really understand why an IOer would ever <laughs> reach that conclusion or would ever hold that conclusion. I know that uh, some of my IO uh, acquaintances believe that um, or they take a position that says something to the effect of if, if Paul actually taught a rapture of the saints, then he was a madman. Um, well, that doesn't really make sense to me because, yes, Paul was a madman. Paul was preaching a message of resurrection from the dead that was about to take place. He was uh, filled with all sorts of superhuman Marvel Avenger type powers. He was uh, doing all kinds of crazy things uh, with the Holy Spirit laying his hands on people and gifts and tongues and all kinds of wackadoodle stuff. So yes, Paul was indeed a madman. The whole situation is off the rails. It's like magic mushrooms on steroids. Um, so yeah, there's no uh, basis to say that, you know, if Paul taught a literal rapture, then he was a madman. Of course he was a madman. Of course this whole story is mad and doesn't make any sense based on what we know as humans is possible. Um, and so yes, that is correct. He was a madman, but indeed, Paul absolutely did teach a literal rapture of the saints. And by avoiding that and by 
um, you know, denying that point, it actually hurts the IO viewpoint because the rapture of the saints actually ties up the story very nicely at the end. Without a rapture of the saints, you have a uh, you have an, an option or a possibility of, of some sort of co um, continuance, if you will, even though there's an abundance of other statements that won't allow that to happen. But what point would it be to not have that event take place? I mean, it doesn't make any sense to not have a rapture at the end, right? <clears throat> Excuse me, because there has to be a, a there has to be an end, right? There has to be a conclusion point. It's like having a, a ice cream sundae, but no cherry on top, right? I mean, that's the whole point. The, the The final calling of the calling up of the saints so that they would join their dead brethren in their eternal promised land is what it's all about. And that is the expectation that the apostles and Jesus and everybody in the New Testament sets for their audience. They set this glorious inheritance that is going to take place in their lifetime um, before some of them died. <clears throat> and they would be changed to immortal beings in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, caught up together with the dead ones in the air where they would forever be with their Lord, right? They would not all sleep. They would not all die. And this matches perfectly what Jesus said about some of you standing here shall not taste death before the Son of Man comes in his kingdom and he will gather together his elect from the four winds of the earth, right? Uh, four winds of heaven. So that's what it was. It was a gathering together of the elect living ones with their dead brethren as one unified new body all immortal, all, all glorified, all angelic beings, <clears throat> and they would be taken to their eternal inheritance, which Paul says the 12 tribes served God earnestly day and night, hoping to attain as he stood before King Agrippa. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I think it's very important that Ioers get on the same page in this regard. For the most part, Iowers are not trying to convince people that this story actually took place, right? I mean, that's not not what we do, right? There are a couple of bozos out there, Beavis and Butthead, Rivers of Eden, Corey Schultz, who are basically like, you know, old school versions of I.O. that did nothing for The View, but want to take credit for everything that I did for The View. Um, and of course, <laughs> from what I understand, Rivers of Eden can't take my name out of his mouth. He brings me up literally every day. Uh, when I'm not even being talked about, he'll bring me up, um, which is great because it shows that I'm living rent-free in his head every day, and I absolutely love that. But those two are like, they're kind of like the nursing home version of IL, right? They're very weak. They're not powerful. They need, you know, they need help and assistance. Um, they didn't do anything for The View, but they actually believe that this story is true. They believe there was a literal rapture of the saints in AD 70. There was a literal taking away and change to immortal and resurrection in AD 70. Right now, if that were the case, there would be some historical proof. I don't care what anybody says. Because remember, this was not just a rapture from the hills of Judea, uh, of um, the hills of Judea, right? Flee to the hills. And wait, they were told, you know, go to the hills and the encampment of the saints. They would wait for the coming of the Lord because obviously the, the armies were surrounding Jerusalem. And when they saw that, <clears throat> Jesus warned them to flee to the hills of Judea. And they waited, right? So, th But this wasn't just about them. <clears throat> this was about the saints all in the known lands as well. You have the... the faraway regions of Corinth, Ephesus, Asia Minor, Colossae, right? This is not just within the borders of Israel. This is the uh, entire region there was believers, there was chosen ones waiting for this coming. In Paul's letters to the Thessalonians and the Corinthians, he tells them about this glorious upward call. That's where the bulk of his content in regards to this event are. And these were, you know, foreign regions. This was not within the confines of Israel. So the upward call would have taken place in outside regions as well. And remember, this was a great multitude from all nations. They're pictured as Ephraim's descendants, right? In Revelation, we have the great multitude from all nations. This was a number that could not be numbered. 
according to the author. So it wasn't just like there were, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 of them. This was a great multitude, far too great to be numbered, that would have had to be raptured up and away in AD 70, according to the view of Rivers of Bleeding and Corey Schmucks. Okay, so where is the historical evidence for that event? Where are the people that lived in those lands, in those regions with these saints that would have said, hey, you know what? I had dinner with little Timmy and little Angela every Sunday and suddenly they're not here anymore. Nobody knows what happened to them. Or what happened to the Joneses, right? They were our neighbors for a long time. I used to see them when I took the trash out in the morning. Little milk camel came by and dropped off the milk to their house every day and, and Mr. Jones would wave to me out on the front porch. But they're gone. I haven't seen them in weeks. They didn't even take any clothes. Their whole house is you know, full. They took nothing. Their money's here. What happened to them? Right? But no, there's absolutely not a single peep in history, not a single record of anybody vanishing, never mind in mass, like the Bible says these, this great multitude was, <clears throat> but not a single person. Okay? No Dateline specials, ancient Israelite Dateline specials. Where did these people go to? They all vanished. No, none of that. Right? And that speaks volumes. <clears throat> absolute volumes, okay? So Rivers and Corey are wrong. Obviously, this event didn't take place. But they're right in the sense that they understand that's what the story is saying, right? It's a, it's a myth. It's a tale. It's not true. It didn't happen. Clearly, there's not a single solitary bit of proof that a calling away a mass of a mass of individuals took place around the time of AD 70 at the fall of the temple and the end of the age. <clears throat> now, the Fool Preterist, F-O-O-L, Fool Preterist, shout out to Tristan Gabriel, I believe he coined that phrase, but it's perfect because they've invented this wackadoodle perspective that says <clears throat> that it all happened, right? Jesus came, the resurrection took place, the change to immortal took place, the dead, the dead were raised, but they say that the living ones the ones that Paul said would be alive and remain and would be changed, the ones that Paul promised this glorious inheritance, right? The ones that they were being encouraged to persevere through much tribulation. They didn't receive a thing, right? All that talk, all that buildup, all that hype that Paul and Jesus and the apostles put on this final coming of Christ, <clears throat> they were looking forward to it. They were wondering where it was, right? Will it still take place? We see the ones in, in Peter <clears throat> asking about his coming. Well, where is his coming? And Peter tells them, he says, be encouraged, basically. He said, the Lord is not slack, as some of you may consider. But he's long-suffering and he's patient and he's waiting so that each one of you will come to repentance. So the mission was going on. The saints were being gathered in. The sheep were being gathered in. And Christ was not going to come until each one had come to repentance. That's the message of the tale. But they were longing for that coming. They were waiting for that coming. They knew it was coming. They, they expected it from what they were told. And so the apostles and the disciples were urging them to hold on a little longer. He's at the door. He's coming soon. He's coming quickly. Okay, that's the point. But according to the fool preterist, literally nothing happened for them. Not a thing, right? The coming of Christ occurred. The dead ones received their inheritance, right? They were raised to new life, to immortal angelic bodies, and they were taken away to this glorious city, this new Jerusalem that only had the 12 tribes' names written on it. They were taken up and away. But the living ones that Paul said would be changed in the twinkling of an eye, oh no, that didn't happen. Those ones actually stayed on planet Earth, according to the fool preterist. Now, picture this. <clears throat> you have this group of individuals that fled to the hills of Judea, awaiting the coming to escape the wrath of the Roman armies. 
and they're waiting, right? They know they've been promised this glorious, immortal inheritance. And so they're excited. They're waiting. <clears throat> the last trump occurs. They hear it. They feel it. But nothing happens, right? No, nothing at all. They don't have a clue what took place because nothing changed for them. They didn't leave. They didn't go to their promise. They didn't receive immortal angelic bodies. They didn't receive any of that. In fact, they would have to now, once the, the slaughtering of all their friends and family was over, they would have to wander back down, take the trek down from the hills of Judea and return to the city of Jerusalem that had been burnt to the ground and all of their relatives and friends murdered by the sword in horrific in a horrific siege of epic proportions where over a million were killed, they would have to go back down. And now, <clears throat> as full preterists, of course, because remember now, they know Jesus already came because obviously they were told that. But now as full preterists, they have to go around and preach the gospel to those who just murdered all of their family and friends. They know that they were promised things from Jesus that they didn't receive. So in other words, it was basically a failed prophecy. But they would go back to Jerusalem to preach this message that, hey, I know you guys murdered all of my friends and family. I know you just burned everything that I collected and owned in my entire life. But here's, a, here's the good news. <laughs> Jesus loves you. Okay. Isn't it ridiculous? Isn't it silly? But that's the fool preterist view. The ones in the nations that were waiting, the ones in Corinth that Paul literally told, if you're married, act as if you're not because the time was short. I mean, what could that possibly mean if not for a rapture, right? That can't mean anything else. That fits so beautifully with my perspective on the rapture of the saints. Paul basically told them, don't worry about your possessions, give them away to the poor, don't worry about your wives. If you're married, live as though you're not because the time is short. In other words, you're not going to be here very long. <clears throat> right? He didn't say you were going to be killed. He just said the time was short for all of you. <clears throat> There's no warning of impending doom on the ones in Corinth, right? They weren't going to all be, you know, dropped a, a, an atomic bomb on and destroyed. The time was short for them because of the upward call that he speaks about in chapter 15 of that same letter. And so his, his theory and his thinking was, don't give your attention to things that aren't important. Right? Focus on what's coming. The glorious inheritance of your immortal promise, your eternal promise. But imagine those ones in Corinth after the final trump, when their dead brethren had been raised, but they received nothing. Not a thing. Imagine them going back out to the streets of Corinth and preaching this message. Now, I don't know about you, but I'd be pretty bummed out if I didn't receive what I was promised, especially if it was an immortal superhero type body. But add to that, there is not a shred of evidence that anyone post-70 preached a full preterist message. In other words, there's no evidence that anyone post-70 preached that Christ had already came and that they were now immortal in some sense, but still would obviously go on to die. They would still die later on, obviously, because they're still living on planet Earth in their uh, mortal bodies. <clears throat> but there's no evidence for that, not a peep. In fact, the earliest wannabes all took a, you know, futuristic type position. So if this had taken place and the fool preterist was correct that Christ came and nothing happened to the ones on earth and they continued on, well, there would be some documentation, some proof of that. But nobody says a peep that Christ had already come. Nobody says a peep that they were already immortal in some sense and now, you know, living in this, you know, glorified body, if you will. Not a peep. So there's only two options, really. Either it didn't happen and it's myth or it did happen and 
there's no and there's no proof for it, right? I mean, those are the only two options. Either Christ promised that this would take place and it didn't take place, therefore it's a failed prophecy because you can't get around the time statements. They're all over the New Testament. I mean, you have to deal with those. That's why futurism is a joke and you can't even take it serious. Or it did happen and nobody recorded it. A great mass of individuals floated off planet Earth in AD 70 in their immortal bodies. Nobody saw it. Nobody recorded it. Nobody said a peep about endless masses of missing individuals. Right? Not likely, right? So, anyways, I just wanted to put that out there because the rapture of the saints is a huge deal. It basically seals up the entire story with a bow on top, the cherry on top of the Sunday, and any IOer that rejects the rapture of the saints needs his head examined because it goes hand in hand with an IO viewpoint. It's the conclusive end to the whole story. Without that, you're selling yourself short. You're allowing people to say that living saints existed on planet Earth after the coming of Christ, after he came, quote, for his saints, and they continued on doing whatever it is they were doing. You're allowing that by not affirming a rapture of the saints. It just doesn't make any sense why any IOer would do that. As crazy as it sounds, as, as wild and wackadoodle as it sounds, it is in fact, indeed, what Paul and Jesus we're trying to convey. Folks, that's where I'll leave it for today. Hope you all enjoyed it. If you did, give it a like, a ruski. If not, you know the drill, and we'll catch you on that next one. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.